Hello. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you so much for this opportunity. Today we will be talking with Deja Fox, Tabata Amaral, and Minister Mila Karowska about sexual and reproductive health rights and justice. I'm Leticia. I am a girl club leader. And today I will introduce Deja, if you can go first and introduce yourself. Sure. Hi there, everyone. My name is Deja Fox. I use she and her pronouns. I'm 21 years old. I'm an activist, I'm a strategist, and I'm a full-time student at Columbia University. Uh, and I'm so grateful to be here with you all today. Thank you, Deja. Tabata? Hello, everyone. Thank you so much, Gaurav, for the invitation. Leticia, Minister Karovska, Deja Fox, it's a real honor to be with you. My name is Tabata Amaral. I'm 27 years old. I represent the state of Sao Paulo in the Brazilian National Congress. I'm an education activist and a political scientist. So thank you very much. I'm very excited for this conversation. Thank you. And finally, Minister Mila Karowska, can you introduce yourself? Your microphone is muted. Thank you. Hi to everybody. Thank you for having me in this panel. This is really important topic that we are discussing today. I'm uh, 37 years old. Uh, I'm firstly gender activist, sexuality, reproductive health and rights activist, and after that, a minister in our countries and North Macedonia. Thank you. So I'm, as the MC said, I'm Letis. I'm 20 years old. I'm a club leader and my club is dedicated to making educational workshops on uh, gender equality and access to justice. Here in Brazil, my club is also dedicated to promoting bills on the end of menstrual poverty. And if you, if you don't mind, we will jump right onto the questions as we have a short time. So the first question is, COVID-19 has changed the social and economic realities of people's lives. In what ways has COVID also impacted the sexual and reproductive health of young people? Maybe if minister, do you want to begin? Yes, absolutely. I think that uh, COVID definitely impacted a lot of aspects of our life, but also teach us what is really important that needs to be addressed during the, uh, all the policies that the countries are creating, especially health, educational, and social policies. Uh, when we are discussing how this impacted the uh, life of young girl and sexuality, repro sexual reproductive health and rights, uh, I think that uh, we learn that uh, gender equality needs to be addressed really hardly in all aspects of uh, living. That uh, if we are discussing for the domestic violence in a pandemia, definitely we need to have a specific measures for supporting the women at home. But when we discuss also for the educational system, the educational system needs to address really in deep sexuality education. Why? Because the women and the girls need to understand how they can protect themselves, where to ask for support and how to be strong. But also the leadership and the leader uh, skills that the, the young girls need to learn in school needs to be really pointed in the educational curricula. And this pandemic shows us this, that uh, saying no, it's easy for those that are empowered, but saying no, for harassment or the other elements, it's not easy for those that are in the rural area, especially when the all services are closed because of pandemia or the other uh, uh, cases that can happen in the in the close or uh, for the uh, future for the for the world. That's why I think that uh, pandemia impacted a lot the politicians and the, those that are creating policies that they can understand more deeply why gender equality and uh, sexuality education is important, but impacted also the life of young people and young women. Why? Because they um, face a different life and they face it challenges in solving the, their problems and their issues that they are uh, facing every day during the pandemic. That's why we offer a lot of uh, 
um, um, SOS lines and the supporting mechanism, but we understand that it's not enough, that we need to work more, uh, more deeply with the peers and to create the networks of support and creating the leaders, especially young women leaders in the, in the system. Yes, that's very true. Uh, maybe if Deja, you want to say something on this matter too? Yeah, I think that this pandemic has really shown us that what we do in terms of sexual and reproductive health cannot be deprioritized, right? Even in the face of a pandemic, this is absolutely a core element of how we create healthy and thriving communities for the long term. Uh, the second thing that I think this pandemic really showed us was barriers that in some ways already existed for a lot of young people uh, to accessing things like birth control um, and other necessary sexual and reproductive health services. Um, and it's really exposed these barriers and pushed a lot of providers uh, to rethink the way that they're meeting young people where they're at. And I think that that is in some ways a benefit, right? We've seen a shift into telemedicine, uh, into targeted outreach and really um, doing doing this uh, sort of peer-to-peer -peer kind of uh, work that I think is really important, relational organizing and how we work that into our strategies. Um, and so I think in some ways, uh, it, it is a benefit that we are now reimagining the ways that we, we connect with young people, the ways that we serve them and the ways that we involve them in the in the work that we're doing, right? Not just as implementers, but really as strategists, as the people um, rethinking what, what it is that we need and how we can make it happen. Um, so I think that that's really important. Um, the first piece being, you know, I think we've all seen that this is a core element of creating healthy communities. And the second piece being that we all are being tasked to reimagine how we, how we serve. Yes, and I think in the pandemic, uh, we reimagined this, this challenges and how we face them, but it's also very important to see that it exposed inequalities um, more than before, like people who don't have access to internet, for example, we have to keep them in mind. But a uh, following question, I will ready to back to Tabata as a policymaker, let's say. Uh, the second question is UNFPA Executive Director Dr. Natalia Kenham has said, COVID is indeed a crisis with a woman's face. How does this statement inform your current efforts to stand for sexual reproductive health and rights? So uh, summing up to what was said before, COVID-19 has exposed and deepened all our inequalities. And speaking of a country as unequal as Brazil is, that means that the poorest woman, uh, the black people, among many others, were much more exposed to the consequence of COVID-19. Currently, in my country, half of the population is exposed to food insecurity. Uh, in this moment, we have gone back 30 years in the past uh, in terms of women's participation in the economy. So that means that all of the challenges that we already had to deal with, they became much worse. So women and young people are much more exposed to violence and abuse, especially sexual uh, violence and domestic violence. That also means that women right now, they are much more exposed to poverty. We have uh, 11.5 million uh, women who are single mothers in my country, who are suffering much more from the economic uh, backlashes of the pandemic. And that also means that since uh, children are out of school and the health services are so much focused on the pandemic that we have less access to information, we have less access to uh, all of the, those facilities that help us uh, denounce a violence or have access to our way out. And speaking of something that's very important to me in my mandate, but with, which I also know is very important to grow up in Brazil, that means that uh, menstruation or period poverty, uh, that reality has gone much worse with the pandemic. Before the pandemic, we knew that out of four girls in Brazil who have between 15 and 17 years old, one didn't have the resources to buy pads. We also knew before that uh, girls uh, would lose up to a month and a half of classes per year because they didn't have access to menstrual resources. So what we are saying now is that because of the pandemic, 
because of all this deepening of our inequality, now girls have even less access to pads, which means and uh, and water and sanitation, which means that they will have uh, less dignity when they cannot access uh, education and job opportunities. That also means that they will have to uh, find other ways, such as uh, use bread or journals or uh, things that are not clean enough, and they will be more exposed to infections. And at the end of the day, of the day this means that they will be less free. So when we are more exposed to violence, when we, are, we have less access to information, when we are more exposed to poverty, we have once again women being the ones that suffer the most. Thank you so much. Yes, I am Brazilian too, and it's very sad because Brazil is already a very violent country with women and uh, with the pandemic it has been worse. But uh, the same question, if Minister Karowska can add anything about her current efforts? Uh, we're trying um, really hard as a government uh, already four years to improve the gender equality in the country. This means creating the policies. But uh, all the measures that were uh, done before uh, during the previous period, I think that we discussed more for uh, support after things are happened. But now as a Minister of Education, I'm trying to create a system of prevention. This means to create the young people that recognize, but also supporting the system of prevention and uh, they are stopping their violent um, um, behavior. Um, especially young girls and uh, boys needs to be educated uh, rightly because uh, our tradition sometimes uh, create atmosphere that uh, the women is, uh, are less uh, important, that the women uh, have uh, less capacities. And that's why through the educational system, we are now trying to uh, introduce gender equality as a, a main pillar in the primary education. We have three pillar pillars. One is inclusion for everybody. Uh, second is gender equality. And the third pillar is interculturality, understanding the different cultures that are living in our country. And we have a, a big opposition in the country uh, trying to say no to this, because those values are really um, important for us, but also for the tradition, for the church, for the others, it's making a little bit um, shaking their uh, basic values of, of tradition and sometimes promoting uh, gender inequality in their speeches and also policies. And uh, in a primary education conception, we are starting with this conception, we are starting in first and fourth grade this September. And uh, we are preparing a new books uh, and they're really inclusive and they're really gender sensitive. And I'm happy for that because they they will be published uh, in the next month. Uh, it's with support of USAID, uh, also with uh, UNICEF and um, Open Society Foundation. And they're really proactive in our country and thanks to them. But I think that we, if we are consistent in this policy, in a primary education to actively discussing about gender equality, sexuality education, uh, we can uh, have in a 15 years from now, better community that we have in this moment. Uh, uh, people that understand why we are discussing for gender equality, that this is not a fight between men and women, but it's just supporting everybody to, and they have a possibility to use their potential fully and invest in the in the country. And um, I'm sure that we are in a good pathway, uh, but we need to be consistent and we need definitely a political support that we are receiving from our international partners a lot in the country. It's amazing to hear uh, all the work you have been doing and the experience that you three have. I'm sure that others think the same. We look up to you as role models for our work. So it's very amazing to have this opportunity. Uh, the next question I will redirect to Deja. That is the letters R and J from Rights and Justice are sometimes left out, left out of discussions about the sexual reproductive health of young people. Why are both rights and justice integral to this conversation and global advocacy for SRH? Yeah, I got my start in sexual and reproductive justice really thinking about sex education and how it was impacting me as a student who like one in 30 students in the United States face homelessness who don't have parents at home to fill in the gaps, right? So I started advocating on my own behalf 
going to my school, but uh, my school board, sharing my story, bringing my friends along to do the same, and then scaled up my work to include things like birth control access. But when I think about rights and justice, right, I really think about access, and I think about what Tabitha was sharing too, with with deepening inequalities, right, with exposing what was already unequal, um, and seeing how they've only grown, um, and how how they've permeated every bit of our lives, right. Um, and so I'm, I've also been thinking a lot, you know, about this idea of, of the face of this pandemic. And, you know, we're, we're talking about how women and girls are bearing the brunt uh, because of pre-existing inequalities. Um, and so I also think about what it looks like to create a world, um, right, when we think about rights and justice, where, where women and girls can be the leaders, be at the forefront of these movements, uh, because they are the most affected. And to do that, we have to create intentionally inclusive environments, right? Where we're not only cultivating them as leaders, but giving them all of the resources that they need to participate fully. Um, and again, I think that this is about how it is that we empower people beyond just access to their needs and really think about um, how we're, the, we're empowering them with, with leadership to continue creating um, sustainable and substantial change within their communities. Um, so that that's my... Um, take on rights and justice. And just a reminder that, you know, it's not just about if and when to have children, but to be able to raise them in communities that are free from violence, right? Um, and remembering that this is about so much more about creating a world that is really defined by choice and empowering women and girls with those choices. Yes, and I think Girl Up and other organizations are a perfect place to develop these leaderships and to give youth this space to take action. And as our time is almost finishing, I would like to ask a final question about, uh, for all of you, what role can youth play to improve access to services and information they need to make informed decisions about their bodies? And what is your message to these youth that are interested in participating in global advocacy for sexual and reproductive health? Where can we start? Maybe if Tabata can go first. Yes. Uh, one thing that's important to mention is that uh, I've been fighting for over one year now to approve two different projects, uh, law projects that I have presented to guarantee that all women and girl in Brazil and person who menstruates have access uh, to pads in health uh, facilities, in schools, in prisons and all, all public facilities. And even though I'm still fighting to approve those uh, two projects in Congress, we have seen such a huge amount of transformation in my country. And I, I would like to say it again, Europe has been such an important partner in this uh, in this fight, because now we have big states in my country, like São Paulo and Maranhão and Rio de Janeiro, and many municipalities who have said, we'll end uh, menstrual poverty in this city, will put an end to period poverty in this state. So uh, we need both types of change, and the national and the local change. And since we are short on time, I would, I would like to leave you with a message. Studies have shown, and I, I really mean it, that with women in power, girls big dream, uh, dream bigger. Sorry for the English. So by that, I mean that representativeness matter. Uh, I think all of these that we are talking about goes hand in hand with this dream that in my country one day, I will look at the Brazilian Congress and I will see it as diverse as my country is with more people with disability, with more uh, women, with more uh, LGBTQI people, with more black people, because my country is very diverse. And the only reason why we are in 2021 and girls miss one month and a half of school per year is because we don't have enough women uh, who come from poor backgrounds in power. At least that's not that was not the reality up to here. So just to say that, yes, changing uh, change is happening, but we need it to be faster. And that's why we need it so much for girls to be a part of this transformation, to see themselves in these uh, places of power. So one day we can look at our national congresses, at our executives and say, those people truly represent me. So again, thank you very much for the invitation. We'll keep on with the good fight. And I hope to meet all of you uh, in other moments of my life. So thank you very much.
Thank you. Uh, Minister Mila, if you can go next. Thank you uh, for inviting me at this panel. I uh, have a message to all girls that they need to be strong, they need to be brave, and they have a really leadership skills uh, that are really important for the world, not just for the countries where we are living, but they're important for the world because just with the women involved in all processes, sitting on every table, we can have a better world. Thank you. And finally, Deja. Yeah. My message to all of the girls out there is that you don't need a fancy degree or a title to be an expert. You are an expert in your experience and that is enough, right? When I stood up in front of my school board and asked for better sex education, demanded better sex education, I spoke from my experience. When I stood in front of my senator and demanded birth control access, I spoke from my experience. Um, and so I want you to remember that your story, your perspective is powerful and it has the capacity, you have the capacity to create change. So don't wait until you feel that you're qualified. Let's change what it means to be qualified. You are an expert in your experience and you deserve to take up space. Thank you so much. That was really inspiring. I appreciate the time that you three have been giving us today to share your experiences. As Tabata said about the bills on menstrual poverty, I am one of the girls responsible for the bill on my state, Rio Grande do Sul. And it's really inspiring to see so many young girls uh, taking up this formal space, this formal decision-making space. And as Deja said, we often uh, feel like uh, we don't have enough experience or we are not qualified to do this, but we are. And I urge all girls that are watching us, be they from Brazil or from other countries, to do the same. Bring this bill to your country or bring other positive changes, you can do it. And I'm very happy with all the work we have been developing. So thank you so much one last time. And I give the black the back the floor back to our MCs. Sorry. 